No matter your church or organization, success in our world requires the skills to decode cultures foreign to our own and maneuver cultural differences even in our own backyard. As a professor at INSEAD, one of the world's leading business schools in France, Aaron Meyer has spent years focusing on how the world's most successful global leaders navigate these kinds of complexities. Whether we are aware of it or not, there are complex variations in what is considered good business and common sense from one culture to another. Whether it is attitudes concerning when best to speak or stay quiet, the role of the leader in the room, or what kind of negative feedback is most constructive, these differences have a tremendous impact on how we understand one another and ultimately on how we get the job done. Winner of the 2015 Thinkers 50 Radar Award, frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review, and author of The Culture Map. Let's welcome Aaron Meyer to the summit. So we are here to talk about how cultural differences impact our effectiveness when we're working internationally. And I'm going to start by giving you two examples about my own clients and how they struggled with this topic. So the first one is about a Chinese client that I worked with. His name was Bo, Bo Chen. And Bo was living in Beijing. And for the first time, he was hired by a company outside of China. He was hired by a company in London. He was really excited. He was hired because he had excellent English, he was very extroverted, and when he got the first opportunity to come to a meeting in London, he prepared. He prepared the entire trip from Beijing to London. Then he arrived, he greeted all of his British colleagues, he said, thank you very much for having invited me. But then during the actual meeting, Bo said nothing at all. At the end of the meeting, he got up again, he shook hands again with his colleagues, and then as he was leaving the room, he accidentally overheard one of his British colleagues saying to another colleague, well, certainly seems like Bo has nothing to add. Right? Okay, that's your first situation. We'll come back to it later. The second situation about, is about a French woman I worked with. Her name was Sabine. When I worked with Sabine, uh, she was living in Paris, but she was just about to be expatriated here. She was moving to Chicago. So I spent some time with her before she moved, helping her think about how she might adapt her style to this American context. And then after she'd been in Chicago for four months, I did a pre-scheduled follow-up call, first with her new American boss, John. And I asked John, how are things going for Sabine? He said to me, Erin, it's not going well. He said, the problem is that I've spoken with Sabine about these things she needs to change several times. and I've seen zero effort on her part to make these changes. He said, you know, if she doesn't start working on this soon, I don't think this expatriation is going to work out. I did, he told me, have my first performance review with Sabine last week, and I was again very clear with her. So I'm hoping to see some effort soon. So I got off the phone with John, with John and I called Sabine, and I said, how are things going in the U.S.? And Sabine said to me, they are going great. She said, you know, Erin, for the first time, I found a job that takes advantage of all of my talents. She said, you know, Erin, I have to tell you, I had my first performance review with my new boss last week, the best performance review I've had in my career. Right? Okay, now these two individuals both had cultural differences impact their effectiveness without even knowing it. So we're going to come back to these guys a little bit later, all right? Now let me just introduce myself a little bit before we get into this topic some more. So um, my situation is a little bit the opposite of Sabine's. I think you could tell that I'm American. I was raised in Minnesota in a very monocultural place. Uh, but now as an adult, I've been living in many other countries, uh, in Southeast Asia and in Southern Africa. And I've lived now in Paris for 15 years. So my husband is French, and this is actually true, my two boys look Logan and Ethan uh, just told me last weekend that they are French, which is quite unsettling for a mother, right, when you hear that your children are a different culture than you are. Uh, so I have been studying how cultural differences are impacting business, and what I've been doing is working on a system for helping people kind of decode these cultural differences, and I call this culture mapping. So I have this system that breaks culture down into these different scales, and we look at how decisions are made differently in different parts of the world. 
world. We look at how we build trust differently in different world regions. And then through lots of research, we have countries that are positioned up and down these scales. So those, uh, little, uh, those little balls there just represent countries. And what's interesting is that as you start to put the dimensions together, you can start to do this kind of culture mapping. So here, for example, I just mapped out French business culture for you and Brazilian business culture. What I wanted to do with you today is to focus on three dimensions that really look at what it means to be a good communicator in different countries. And then afterwards, I'll give you some opportunities to learn more about the other dimensions, if you'd like, okay? Um, so in order to get started with this, I need to mention two things. The first is that, of course, when you look at the country positions, I know they look to be very precise. But please keep in mind that, of course, in every culture, we have quite a bit of variance, individual variance. So, I mean, if you were doing research with me in Australia, we might find that some Australians are falling you know, to the left of this, uh, this curve. Uh, Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little lost here. Um, to the left of this, to the left of this gray curve, some to the right, and then we would get to the the Australian positioning. If we were doing research in Kenya, we might find that some Kenyans are falling to the left of the yellow curve, some to the right of the yellow curve, and then we would have the Kenyan positioning. So just keep in mind that, of course, although the country looks very specific, that there's always individual, regional, or generational variance within a country. Right? Okay. The other thing I need to point out before we start looking at the research, is that um, when you look at the countries, don't think about the absolute positions of them, only consider the relative difference. So to give you an example of this, I was working a while ago with a team, and at the beginning, I had just Americans and French on the team. And I asked the Americans, what's it like to work with the French? And the Americans said to me, well, Aaron, you know the French. They said they are very chaotic. They're very disorganized. They're always late. They're always changing the topic. It's very difficult to follow them. A little bit later, I had a group from India that joined the same team. And I asked the Indians, you know, how's it going working on this French team? And the Indians said to me, well, Aaron, you know the French. They're very rigid. They're very inadaptable. They're so focused on the structure and punctuality of things that they're not able you know, to adapt as things change around them. And that's linked to what I call this time orientation scale, where you can see on the scheduling scale that France falls between the US and India, which then leads to these opposite perceptions. I gave the same example in Germany a little while ago. And one of the Germans said, you know, Aaron, this is a funny example for us, because we, the Germans in this room, we work frequently with Americans. And we are always complaining that the Americans are exactly the same way that you've just described that the Americans complain about the French, right? So that's how these dimensions work. It's not about what is that culture like. It's about how do cultures respond to or understand one another. Okay, so with that, I would love to get started with our first dimension, and I want to talk with you about the, these terms, low versus high context communication. And I'll just start by saying that in a low context culture, when we communicate, we assume or consider that we have a low level of shared reference points. So in a low context culture, when we're communicating, we feel that we don't have the same relationship or information or context. And because we assume a low level of shared context, in these cultures we believe that good, effective, professional communication is a communication that's very explicit. It's very simple and very clear. In a low context culture, I believe if I want you to understand blue, I have to say blue. In a low context culture, I'm taught that if I give a presentation, I should tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I tell you, and then I tell you what I've told you, right? Why do I tell you the same thing three times? Because everything is about the simplicity and the clarity of the message. Now, in a high context culture, while we're communicating, we assume that we have a much larger uh, body of shared reference points. And because we have all of the shared context, in these cultures, we believe that good, effective professional communication is much more sophisticated. 
is more nuanced or implicit or layered. I teach in two languages, English and in French, and there are these words in the French language that mean high context. We don't even have these words in English. There's this word sous-entendu, and sous-entendu means when I speak, don't listen to my words. Listen to the meaning behind my words. So it's not what I said that matters, it's what I meant that matters. In, uh, in Japanese, so the Japanese culture is the highest context culture in the world. In Japanese, there is an expression which is kuki yomenai, and the expression means someone who is unable to read the atmosphere or someone who is unable to pick up the subtle messages in the air. So in Japan, a good communicator can really pick up all of those subtle, unspoken messages. And a good, uh, poor communicator is kuki yomenai, right? Okay, so now I just like to start by looking at uh, some of these countries with you. And you can just see as you look up here, first of all, the, co the co colors don't mean anything. I just have, for example, different regions and different colors. But you can see when you look up here that all of the Anglo-Saxon countries fall to the left-hand side of this scale. The U.S., the lowest context country in the world, right? <laughs> um, then if we move over, you could see that we have many Latin countries and Mediterranean countries that fall kind of mid-right on the scale. And then further over, you would find many African countries and even further, many Asian countries. And partially, this is linked to language. So many Asian languages are very high context in themselves. For example, in Hindi, the word kul means both tomorrow and yesterday. So you see that in the language, you have to constantly be reading the air to understand what the word means, right? Then I'd just like to get you to think about how this impacts an interaction. I had a German who said to me, you know, Aaron, in Germany, at the end of a meeting, we almost always do a recap, right? First we do a verbal recap, and then we do a written recap, and then we send that out, right? He said, now that I've been working in France, Often at the end of a meeting, I'll get ready to do that recap, and my French colleagues will just stand up, and someone will say, et voila. And I'll think to myself, but voila what? <laughs> and I'll be so surprised to see that it just seems that people know what's been decided. They understand who's supposed to do what, without going through all of those levels of clarity that I'm so used to. So one thing you can take away from this is that in low context cultures, we tend to nail things down in writing more frequently than in high context cultures where we leave everything open for verbal interpretation, right? A second example, I was in China last year working with a multinational American company. And before I worked with them, the chairman of the company who was from New York City gave a presentation. Afterwards, he left. I was talking about this with his employees. The human resource director from Shanghai raised his hand, and he said, you know, Aaron, this is really interesting for me because the whole time the chairman was talking, I was trying to make sure that I was listening with all of my senses, that I was picking up all of the levels of meaning that the chairman was trying to pass. And now that I'm looking at this, I'm asking myself, is it possible that there was no meaning? <laughs> and I thought to myself that that chairman would have been very surprised to know that anybody was trying to read the air beyond his literal words, right? Now, my third example is about parenting. Uh, I had this Nigerian woman who said to me a few weeks ago, she said, in Nigeria, we raise our children to be high context. She said, you know, if I have people over for dinner and my daughter says to me, mom, can I have another sweet? I will say to her, of course you can. But she knows by the look in my eye <laughs> that I bet she better not touch that sweet. And you know, I just thought about 
how I raise my children. And, you know, I learned this system from an American parenting book. I have sat down with Logan, who's seven years old, right? And we made a list of all of the rules. We typed them out, and we posted them on the refrigerator. And I'll say to Logan, you know, no, you can't do that. And he'll say, well, Mom, that's not fair. It's not written on the refrigerator. So you can see already at age seven that one child is learning to read the messages in the air. And the other child is learning the most important message is the one that's written down, right, and put on the refrigerator. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is just get you to think about how people complain about one another when they're working internationally. Low context people, they say that high context people are lacking transparency, that they're hiding information, they're secretive. High context people say that low context people are condescending. They talk to us like we're children. Either they're not very smart or they think we're not very smart. I had someone from Indonesia in my class who said, you know, Aaron, in my culture, if we have a discussion and we, on the phone and we make some decisions verbally, that would be enough for me. And then if you get off of the phone and you put into writing everything we've decided and you send that to me, that would be a clear sign to me that you don't trust me. Right? So a lot of people are having these reactions going back and forth without really knowing what's behind it. And if you think about what is behind it, I mean, just think about the history of the U.S., the lowest context culture in the world, and Japan, the highest context culture in the world. I mean, Japan, an island society, a homogeneous population, people living in very close proximity for thousands of years. The Japanese just got to the point that they could read the atmosphere. In the U.S., 250 years ago, people moving from all over the place, having different histories, different backgrounds. Americans learned if you want to pass a message, you really have to simplify that message to the lowest common denominator, right? So that brings me to my first conclusion, which is global teams need low context processes. And that's because when you're communicating across cultures, the most difficulty happens not between one low context culture and another low context culture, like Americans working with Japanese, sorry, Americans working with Germans, not between one low context culture and a high context culture, like Americans working with Japanese, but between one high context culture and another high context culture, like the French working with the Chinese, because we're all speaking between the lines, we're all reading the air, but the context that we use for that communication is very different. Okay, we finished our, just about finished our first dimension, but I need to do something very important for me as an American before I move on, which is tell you what I've told you. So uh, let me just start by doing that now. Uh, could you go back, please? Uh, so the first thing that we got already is global teams need low context processes, fine. Uh, beyond that, if you're working with low context people, go ahead and be as clear as you can, put it in writing, recap uh, three times. Now that's fine, but what if you're working with a higher context culture? In that case, you might repeat yourself less, you might ask a lot of clarifying questions, and you might focus on increasing your ability to read the atmosphere. And I'm going to give you one last example. So this is a humiliating example for me, but I will share it with you for the good of the group. So the situation was that I finished writing my book in the Culture Map in May 2014, and I was feeling really proud of myself, like I'd really accomplished something. And I then took a trip to Japan and I gave a presentation to a small group of Japanese and at the end I asked if there were any questions and no one raised their hand so I went to sit down. My Japanese colleague then said to me, Erin, I think there were some questions. Do you mind if I try? Fine. So then he stood up and he said to the audience, Erin Meyer has just spoken with you. Do you have any questions? No one raised their hand. But this time he looked very carefully at the group. Mm -hmm. Yes, do you have a question? <laughs> and the person said, yes, thank you, I do. And he asked a very important question. And then he did it again. 
then he did it again. He said, are there any other questions? Mm-hmm. And the person asked a very important question. So afterwards, I said to him, but how did you know that those people had questions? And he said to me, well, he thought about it. And then he said, well, it had to do with how bright their eyes were. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, for me coming from Minnesota like I do, that's really difficult. But then he clarified. He said, you know, Aaron, in Japan we don't make as much direct eye contact as you do in the West. So when you ask the group if there are any questions, most people are not looking right at you. They're looking somewhere else. But there were these two people in the group who were really looking right at you. And their eyes were bright, which signifies they would be happy to have you call on them if you would like to. Okay? So the next day I gave another presentation. Again, I asked if there were any questions. Again, no one raised their hand. But this time I thought I would just try. So I did what he suggested. You know, I looked carefully at the audience, and I saw immediately that he was right, that most people were not looking directly at me. And as I looked at them carefully, I saw that there was this one woman in the room who was really looking right in my eyes. And when I looked at her, she held my gaze. Now, were her eyes bright? I don't know. <laughs> but... I wanted to try, so I made a little bit of a gesture to her, and she nodded her head. And I said, do you have a question? And she said, thank you. And she asked a very important question. It was such an important learning experience for me, because imagine, at the school I teach, I have people from all over the world in my classes every single day. Can you imagine? I had all of these bright eyes that I was entirely missing. So we need to constantly be working on these things, right? Okay, now I want to move on to our second dimension, which is one that looks at how we give negative feedback or criticism in different parts of the world. And um, I'm just going to start by giving you an example about a client that I worked with. I had this British guy who was working on a team with this guy from the Netherlands. And the British guy wrote a report, and he sent it to the Dutch guy for feedback. And when the Dutch person received the report, he thought it was horrible. He thought, there's no way that we can send this to the client like this. So when the Dutch person called up the British person, he had the value system of the importance of honesty that drove the way he gave the feedback. And he said, you know, I read through your report, and there's no way that we can send this to the client like this. He said the introduction is weak, but here are some things we could do in order to improve the introduction. He said there's a lack of logic flow in the middle of the report, but here are some things we could do in order to improve that logic flow. A number of grammatical errors that I've circled here for you. And as he went through that feedback, the British person was taking this feedback really emotionally. He was thinking, this person is an arrogant jerk, and he doesn't seem to like me very much. He thought, this is the last time that I'm going to ask that person for feedback. Now, if you imagine the tables turn, and in the second situation, it's exactly the opposite. This time, the Dutch guy writes the report. He sends it to the British person who thinks it's horrible, who thinks about how to improve it. But when the British person calls up the Dutch person, he gives the feedback in a different way. So he starts by saying, you know, I read through your report, and there were a number of things about the report that I thought were good. So this section I thought was very well written. This is what I liked about it. This section here I thought was very well researched. This is what I liked. Now, if you wanted to make some changes, I have just a few small suggestions for you. So I was thinking that the introduction to this report could be even stronger with just some small modifications. And the middle of the report could have a very powerful impact with some minor adaptations. There's some very small grammatical errors, no problem at all. I just clean those right up, right? Overall, fine. Now, when the Dutch person got this report, this feedback, he took it at face value. He thought, the report's pretty good. I'll spend three minutes making a few small changes. And then he sent it out to the client. And then he found out a week later from someone else that that British person didn't like the report. And now he thought, this guy is a hypocrite, right? You can't trust him. He lied to me. He thought, this is the last time that I'm going to ask this person for feedback. So when you think about what it means to, be, to give constructive feedback, 
please recognize that that's different from one part of the world to another. Now, when you look at the country positions here, you'll see that some countries have shifted from being to the right-hand side on the last scale, to the, so they, they are high-context cultures, to the left-hand side of this scale. So these are cultures. So these are high-context, direct cultures. Those are cultures where we speak between the lines a lot, we read the air a lot, but if it comes to giving a negative message, we're much more likely to use what I call upgraders, which are words that make the negative message feel stronger, such as, this is absolutely inappropriate, or this is totally unacceptable. In more indirect cultures, we use more downgraders, like you might possibly think about doing this a little bit differently, maybe, right? Um, <laughs> Now, another thing you might notice is that some of the countries have shifted from being low context to more middle on this scale. So the U.S., the lowest context culture in the world, very focused on recapping key points, putting things in writing, clear as possible in all situations except when it comes to giving negative feedback. And at that moment, Americans have been taught to give three positives with every negative, to catch people doing things right, now, to do positive anchoring, which means if I have to tell you your message is, your work is not okay, I should start by telling you what I like about your work, which shows respect, before I tell you what to do differently. And I think now you can understand what happened to poor Sabine. I mean, Sabine, who comes from a country, France, where positive feedback is given less frequently and less strongly, negative feedback is given more strongly. So when she went into that performance review with John, and John started by giving her those three positives, she thought to herself, wow, this is the best performance review I've ever received. When he got to the real message, she wasn't even listening anymore. Now, I also wanted to make a quick comment here as you're looking at the U.S. and France about our education systems, which is, of course, where this all starts. And I told you I have these two little boys, uh, Ethan and Logan, and I brought them this summer. So they were born in France. They've always lived in France. So I brought them this summer to Minnesota. They're there right now, to Minnesota, so that they could learn how to read and write in English. And I just see the way they're bathed differently. So... In the U.S., when Ethan comes home from school, he shows me his paper, and his American teachers have written things like, excellent work, exclamation mark. They put stars and smiley faces, fantastic, right? And I, when he doesn't do well, they write things like, you're almost there. A little more effort, you're on your way. And I can tell you, it is not like this in France. So in France, when Ethan takes this dictate, this dictation test on Monday, all week long he prepares. It gets to be Monday, he takes the test, he comes home, he shows me the paper. There's always red marks all over it. And the teacher will have written things like, applique toi, exclamation mark, which means apply yourself. Or she will have written N-A, which means skills not acquired. And when I see this research, it hurts me. I think, oh, he's going to lose his self-esteem. He's not going to want to go to school anymore. But I'm the one having culture shock. You know, Ethan, he understands the feedback in the context it's received. Mom, what's the big deal? I had the fifth best paper in the class, right? <laughs> so... I know you're not managing nine-year-olds, but I do believe that this, uh, this feedback teaches us to have a tougher skin or a more sensitive skin later on in life. Okay, I'd like to, we went through these first two scales already, I'd like to wrap up now quickly with our third scale by going back to the first situation we started with, which was Bo Chen. Okay, so you remember Bo, right? He'd done all of his preparation, and he didn't say anything in this meeting. And when I worked with Bo, he was suffering, at least partially, from this dimension that looks at what silence means in different parts of the world. And I'll just imagine that you ask me a question. And I'm silent for a few seconds. What does that silence indicate in your tribe? If you come from a country like the U.S., 
France, the UK, Brazil. You might think that silence means something very negative. Like maybe you'll think that I'm angry or I hadn't understood you. I'm uncomfortable. You'll respond by filling up that silence, by asking another question or answering the question yourself, right? If we come from a high com comfort with silence culture, like Japan, Indonesia, Bochens, China, you might perceive that same silence as something very positive, like that I'm a good listener, or I'm thinking carefully before I give a response, or it might suggest nothing at all. There was, I've, I've seen in my own work that Americans become uncomfortable with silence around the two to two and a half second mark in a dialogue. And the same research shows that the Chinese can easily go up to seven or eight seconds of silence without feeling that anything unusual is happening. And if you just think about what that means for a discussion, in some cultures, one person talks and another person talks at the same time, right? In these cultures, if we talk simultaneously, it shows I'm very passionate. We have a great relationship. Everything's going well. In, uh, I'll put, in that first category, I would put Latin cultures, Mediterranean cultures, Arabic cultures, some African cultures. The second pattern, these are what we call perfect timing cultures. In these cultures, we talk like we play ping pong. They, we don't like overlap and we don't like silence. And I would put Anglo-Saxon countries, including the US, as well as Germanic cultures into this pattern. And the third pattern is one that looks more like this, where one person might speak and then there's a pause before the next person responds. And I think you could, I would put all East Asian countries into this third pattern. So you can see now what happened to poor Bo Chen, right? If you have people from all three of these cultures working together, the third group loses because they're waiting for that moment to speak that never comes, right? <laughs> When I worked with Bo, he said, you know, I'm so frustrated, Aaron. I go to these meetings, I'm all prepared. No one ever gives me a moment to speak, right? We can work on that when we're leading a global team by inviting people to speak, giving them a clear moment, recognizing that we are responsible for giving everyone the opportunity. Okay, uh, I am going to wrap up now. Uh, I know we only got to go through three dimensions today, but if you're interested in this topic, you can go to my website, and I actually have a couple of uh, AaronMeyer.com, and I have, have a couple of little tools you can play with. They're just free tools, but one of them, you can click on up to 55 countries, and you can get the culture maps of whatever countries you might be working or living with. And the second one is a short self-assessment where you can fill out some questions and get your own personal map, and then you can find out if you are living in the right country. Uh, <laughs> okay, it was a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.